Welcome everyone to our Young Exit webinar on the Draft Code of Conduct for Adjudicators. Thank you very much to all participants for joining us today. We know that many of you are connecting from all around the world and we very much appreciate your participation. Before I turn to presenting our panelists today, we wanted to give you a short introduction to today's topic. As you know, in May of this year, ICSID and UNCITRI released a joint draft code of conduct for adjudicators, addressing many key ethical and contested issues identified by the members of UNCITRI Working Group 3, which focuses on investor state dispute settlement reform and by critics of the system. The draft code seeks to offer policymakers numerous choices to regulate the behavior of adjudicators. Because the draft code is likely to affect the future of the arbitration practice, we thought it would be important for young practitioners to hear from our distinguished panelists today on this topic. The webinar is set in an interview format, seeking to get insights on the draft code of conduct from different stakeholders. And for that purpose, we're very happy to present today our panelists. First, we have Chiara Giorgetti, professor at Richmond University and former scholar in residence at Exit who concentrated on the organization and drafting of the Code of Conduct during her time here at Exit. Next, Maire Uran Bidegain, head of the program for the defense of the state in international investment arbitration at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Chile. Carol Dale, partner and head of the international arbitration practice at Michigan de Reina, and author of the book titled Challenge and Disqualification of Arbitrators in International Arbitration. And finally, Claudia Frutos Peterson, partner at Curtis Malay Frutos Cold and Mole and managing partner of the DC office, who regularly acts as counsel and arbitrator in commercial and investment disputes. After the session, we will leave some time to answer questions from the audience. We encourage all participants to send questions via the chat box feature on WebEx to our host Damon or to the panelists. Finally, and before we begin, I just want to mention that this webinar will be recorded and that participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers, nor that of any other participant may be revealed without their permission. Now turning to our Q&A, the first topic for today's discussion concerns the background and negotiations of the code. And Chiara, we will start with you. Can you please tell us a little bit about the background of the draft code of conduct, how UNCITRAL and ICSID joined forces for this project, and what was your role in it? Absolutely. Well, first, uh, let me thank you very much, uh, and Celeste, for inviting me. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity to speak about a code, which I think it's um, uh, it, it, is, it is a very important step uh, for, uh, for ISDS reform pro uh, process. As for your question, I think one of the issue ethics has been on the forefront of some of the criticism of the ISDS system for quite a while, especially in relation to the, the nomination, uh, the appointment of arbitrators and independence and impartiality. So I think there was the, the, there was the, the discussion on, on a code and on issue was very much right when uh, Working Group 3 of UNCITRAL decided to, uh, to, to look into a reform of the ISDS process. In terms of how the code itself came about, it was the uh, delegation of Algeria in 2016 that suggested for a code to be taken up by UNCITRAL. And so since 2016, so the other member states then, uh, then agreed uh, and it was taken up as an issue by, by Working Group uh, 3. Between 2016 and 2019, then states uh, commented and provided some uh, background information and principles and comments um, on, on the content of the code itself. And in October 2019, IS uh, ICSID, uh, which by itself was already part of uh, a, um, a process of reform in terms of the rules amendment process, and UNCITRAL um, decided then to uh, kind of join force and the working group three delegation delegates uh, asked um, ICSID and UNCITRAL to join force and prepare a code. And this happened in October 2019, so very, very, uh, very quickly then the code was drafted. At that time, I was a um, 
uh, a scholar in residence at ICSID. I was on sabbatical from Richmond, and I've had an interest in ethics for a very long time. Um, so I worked on the code while at ICSID. I, I researched, I did the, uh, you know, the, the, the background research and drafted most of the preliminary, uh, preliminary first drafts uh, uh, of most of the provisions for discussions. Um, and then uh, these, these drafts were then taken up by, uh, by ICSID and ANSIT altogether until uh, a, uh, the draft code that we now have was, uh, was published. Thank you very much. Uh, following up on that, can you tell us what were the guiding principles that inspired the draft and what were the sources of the code? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's another very, very, very good question. Now, um, states, as I mentioned, throughout uh, the from 16 to 19, really provided a lot of information and uh, and principles, guiding principles, and not only state delegates, but also other stakeholders that were involved in working group three uh, discussions. And I would say that uh, we received uh, uh, essentially two kinds of, um, of guidelines. On one side, principles to be included in the code. So, for example, the issue of efficiency, the issues of competence, the state said, well, we should include something like that in the draft. But there were also issues that certain states asked the drafters to include, but these issues are much more complicated. So, for example, the idea of issue conflict, the idea of multiple appointments, or the idea of, of double hatting of multiple roles. Those were asked, so the, the state delegate said, can, can you say something about it? Can you include them? Um, uh, so, can you, can you include uh, uh, um, the, the, the issue in the code itself? Uh, and this is what was done also. So you will see that essentially the two, the two ways in which the code includes these, these guidelines. Um, once we include, the, the principles are included, for issues that are a bit more complex, like issue conflict, uh, a lot of the draft code includes bracket tests so that um, the states can then decide kind of which way to go. In terms of um, the background and the guiding principles and what we use at sources. Now, there are several uh, arbitration codes that exist, international arbitration codes. Uh, we took example mostly from um, existing uh, codes uh, from um, other investment inter international investment treaties, uh, CETA or other that was negotiated by, by the European Union. Um, the code itself, the draft, comes with two commentaries. And one, so the, the commentary itself uh, includes a lot of the background that was included in the code. So where the principles come from and what are the issues that the, the, the different provisions try to tackle. Um, but there's also Annex 2, which provides a table with the similar provisions uh, that are included in other codes. And I think this is all includes kind of some, some of the sources and it, it's pretty, it's quite helpful uh, when we look at the code and, um, uh, and we want to see where, uh, what backgrounds, what kind of backgrounds was used. Great, thank you so much. Claudia, in your opinion, what value does a code of conduct bring if compared to the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest? How would the code of conduct interplay with all other codes or guidelines that are out there and that you know of? Thank you, Anna, but uh, let me also thank, you know, Young Exit for inviting me. This is a wonderful opportunity to, you know, see colleagues uh, that uh, young friends, and I, I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, this, uh, you know, as Kiara was saying, I mean, the, uh, this is an initiative that it was long, long waited for, you know, so I think uh, uh, we have had uh, instruments, and uh, we have instruments in the investment arbitration that could help with some of the issues that the code is discussing but ultimately I think the the, the draft code of conduct is really an initiative that is going to complement and finally you know um, uh, assess or address some of the issues that we have been discussing in the community for a long time uh, you know uh, I think um, the, the, um, in a way, one could say that this is uh, this is something that right now then is going to complement what we have. And I'm in, I'm, I'm thinking in particular, in particularly the IBA rules on the conflict of interest. Uh, you know, so the code uh, will be like a good complement 
uh, but in other ways, and for example, that, that I'm just thinking out loud right now, that subject could be disclosures. You know, I mean, we know that the IBA rules on conflict of interest, they put a lot of emphasis on that particular subject. But the code of conduct does more, in my opinion. You know, the idea here is really to, um, uh, more than to give guidance, you know, to really uh, establish provisions that adjudicators, they will follow. And, uh, and I know that later on we're going to talk about enforcement uh, of the code of conduct, but I just want to say that to me, uh, that's basically what it will be the main difference with everything else that is out there. Because the idea ultimately is, even though this is a starting as a soft law, uh, you know, uh, uh, a uh, group of provisions, if you want, uh, that parties will be referring to and adjudicators they will be referring to. Ultimately, the idea is that in this very big, broad context of reform of uh, investment arbitration, we will end up by having a code of conduct to adjudicators that is going to be obligatory. So that, to me, is really um, uh, the difference with everything else that we have out there right now. I would leave it there. Thank you, Claudia. Maire, uh, many of the codes of code of conduct that serve as the basis of this code, and as mentioned by Chiara earlier, um, are containing instruments negotiated by the EU, um, CIRA, the EU Singapore Investment Protection Agreement, the EU Vietnam Draft FDA, the Draft EU Vietnam IPA. Um, from your perspective and knowledge, is there a Latin American approach to regulating the code of adjudicators? Um, th thank you very much, Anna, for, for the question. And, and of course, since this is uh, the first time I take the floor, I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank you, thank Celeste, uh, and of course, um, thank Young Ixit for, for, uh, for the invitation to this timely event. Um, and before I proceed to respond to your question, as a good government employee, I do have to make a disclaimer that uh, my comments today can only be attributed to me and may not be attributed. To, uh, the Republic of, of Chile. Now, turning to your question, um, indeed, um, I'll begin by mentioning that the, the instruments that you refer to not only have one trading partner, which is the European Union, but they also all include a, a potential bilateral investment court system and not traditional ISDS for the resolution of disputes between investors and, and states. So, from this one, could and did conclude that regulating the conduct of, of adjudicators has been possible or thought to be desirable only in conjunction with an investment court system type of setting. But I don't think that is that is the case. Uh, Chile, for example, has regulated the conduct of, of adjudicators in recently negotiated treaties. The most obvious one and the one that is mentioned in the annex uh, to the code is CPTPP, which uh, is a multilateral treaty that regarding Latin America, which is the focus of, of your question, uh, also includes Peru and Mexico apart from Chile. Uh, but we also have other treaties. We have, for example, the FTA, the updated FTA between Chile and, and Canada, where the parties have incorporated provisions regulating the conduct of uh, arbitrators uh, by confirming the, let's see, the, by confirming the, the arbitrator's obligation to remain independent throughout the proceeding, uh, the, the uh, treaty also bans double heading and it provides for a mandatory compliance with the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest and international arbitration. And if we focus also only in um, focus on interregional agreements in Latin America, the FTA between Chile and Argentina contains an agreed code of conduct for arbitrators that applies to both state-to-state -state disputes and investor-state disputes. Uh, in the section relating to ISDS, it bans the practice of multiple roles and declares that the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest uh, is applicable on a supplementary basis. Not only Chile, there are other countries in the region, such as Peru and Honduras, who have signaled in some of their recent investment treaties their intention to regulate the conduct uh, of arbitrators in ISDS through uh, codes of conduct. So um, I do believe that it's fair to say there's there is uh, there's been a concern in Latin America uh, to regulate the code of conduct for some time now. 
and uh, and I hope that the, the draft code that we're discussing with its potential data law application uh, to all types of adjudicators and perpetrators will ease this, this task that has already started in Latin America. Thank you, Maida, and we'll we'll stay with you for the second topic, um, the standard of independence and impartiality, that is reflected in Article Four. From the state's perspective, what do you think are the concerns regarding the independence and impartiality of adjudicators, and would you say that the code addresses these concerns? Um. Thank you. So with regard to the, the concerns, the first part of, of your question, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll mention those that have been um, recurrently referred to in the context of the working group three discussions at UNCITRAL that, that Chiara also um, briefly introduced uh, before. As to the, the concerns, this include the question of conflict of interest and issue conflict that, that arise or could be perceived to arise from the practice of, of arbitrator of arbitrators wearing two or more hats in ICS matters. Uh, in fact, in one of the reports of the of the working group, it has been even mentioned as the main issue of concern. And, and I quote: um, "So this this of course uh, is something that comes up uh, every time that the ethical concerns of, of arbitrators are are discussed." Another issue that has been regularly mentioned by states. Um, are concerns relating to the fact that the majority of disputes are adjudicated by arbitrators from a certain region, a particular background and profile. And on this point, what states have uh, raised uh, and, and the concerns that they've tried to, to, to transmit is that a, a lack of a diverse set of adjudicators, um, it's perceived as resulting in disputes being decided by tribunals that don't have the legal, cultural, and linguistic background necessary to truly understand the disputes, and in particular, the concerns behind policy makings of states or the public interest issues that the regulations seek to address. And um, this has in turn resulted in the failure to adjudicate the disputes in a fair and impartial manner, which of course is, is a big concern. Um, another category relates to uh, the appointment process itself. First, there are concerns over the lack of transparency of the appointment process when appointing authorities are called on to assist in the constitution of the tribunal. But there are also issues raised that are simply inherent to the party appointment process itself. And what I mean is, is that some states uh, do consider that um, the party appointed arbitrators are generally or might be uh, in some circumstances, better said, uh, generally inclined to decide disputes for the benefit of the party that has been responsible for uh, their appointment, which is, of course, a concern that is amplified when that arbitrator has been appointed before by that same party or by counsel to uh, that same party, um, bringing in the problems of, of repeat appointments. And finally, another uh, recurring concern um, mentioned by states, uh, which I won't elaborate in, uh, for lack of time, is are the conflicts of interest resulting from the practice of third party funding. As to your the second part of your question, namely whether the code addresses all these concerns, I think the answer is as currently drafted, what the, the code that we have in front of us today, it does not. Uh, but but I think we all need to take into consideration that this is only a draft, that it is meant to be enriched by comments from states and, and other stakeholders. So my call today would be for uh, state representatives to be very proactive or and even bold in making comments, suggestions, uh, observations, and to truly use this opportunity to regulate the, the conduct of arbitrators and, and make sure that we don't leave problems that can be solved unsolved. And I'm confident that this will be the case. Thank you very much, my dear, for that perspective. Now, uh, following up on that, from the point of view of the private sector, Carol, um, which ones would you say are the concerns of the private sector? Does the private sector share uh, these concerns? And would you say that the code of conduct addresses the concerns of the private sector? Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, 
first of all, in, in, in terms of the concerns of the uh, private sector, what so what I did uh, to start this exercise was basically um, to look into the challenges that were made in exit uh, since 2015. And I also looked at the challenges that were uh, made under the UNC 12 rules. And look at those challenges and look at the grounds for challenge that uh, private parties or states uh, were making. Because, I mean, if we want to talk about the concerns, I think it's a good starting point to look at, you know, what are they actually complaining of uh, when, when they are filing an actual challenge and want uh, to see uh, an arbitrator removed uh, because, yeah, I mean, they, they, they do not agree uh, with the conduct or at least with, with, with the appearance of impartiality and independence of that arbitrator. And uh, what is interesting, if, if you look at um, if you look at the statistics, then basically the concerns of the private sector is more or less identical to the concerns of of the states. So, I mean, there are three uh, particular issues that this code of conduct is is focusing on. One is is uh, repeat appointments. The other one is at the double heading or, or the multiple roles. And the third one is issue conflicts. So if you take those three together, then for the states, 53% of all these grounds belong to one of those three categories. But for the private parties, it's not 53%, it is 50%. So it's only like 3% difference between the states uh, and, and uh, the, the, the private parties. It's the same thing, uh, for example, the, the second big group of challenges is based on uh, adverse rulings or conduct by the arbitrators in a particular uh, arbitration. Now also the numbers are pretty similar. It's 24% for the states and 19 for the investors. And then the last big category is like the relationships and, and the failure to do, disclose these relationships where it's 18% for the states and um, 22% for the investors. So in terms of the, the grounds and the concerns that private parties are raising through their challenges, it's very, very similar to what uh, the states uh, are raising. Now, to get to the second uh, part of the question, does the code um, addresses these concerns? Well, in, in, in theory, it does. Um, in practice, uh, I think it doesn't. And why not? I mean, the, the way the, the code is drafted for the moment, I think the key obligation now for arbitrators, and don't forget, we are talking here about a code that is supposed to change the conduct of the arbitrators. Yeah. So what the code does in terms of the arbitrators, it basically um, focuses on their disclosure obligation. So, for example, in terms of, uh, you know, the repeat appointments or the issue conflicts, we'll come back to that later. It's Article 5, but the, the main focus for the moment is the disclosure by arbitrators. Now, to me, that doesn't really solve the issue. Why? Because if you only in the code focus on disclosure, what you really do is to shift the, the focus on Council, first of all, and secondly, the adjudicators of the challenges. Why am I saying this? First of all, Council, once you have the disclosure by the arbitrator, I mean, disclosure is easy. I mean, you just reveal what you've done, but that's not the problem. Then the problem becomes it's for Council then to determine what exactly they are going to do with that information. And they have to decide within a very short period whether or not on the basis of the information disclosed, whether or not they will challenge the arbitrator. It's a very important decision, uh, more so because you have to make it in a very short period of time. Because if you look at the, for example, the new, the, the proposed exit rules, uh, the, the, the new rules that are on the table, they've not been approved yet, but what is being proposed now is that uh, within 21 days, 
uh, of of becoming uh, aware of issues, you you have to uh, raise them through a challenge, or otherwise you will be considered to have waived that issue. So that's the first thing, council. Then once council has decided to bring a challenge, then actually you put the problem on the table of those people who have to educate um, the challenge and having to decide whether in the facts of a case, the conduct of the arbitrator, you know, whether or not he should have accepted the appointment, where, uh, whether or not he has an issue conflict and so forth, it's up to the adjudicators then to decide that. And so then you come to the issue of what is the standard of disqualification that they are going to apply and how they are, are they going to apply it in concrete circumstances. And the code is silent on the standard of disqualification and on the concrete application of the standard to um, the facts of the case. So that's why I'm saying, you know, in, in theory, the code, yes, deals with a number of issues, but it's all about the application of the code in practice. And the code is silent on that. And, and that's why, from my point of view, uh, when we really talk about uh, changing the conduct of arbitrators, uh, it's not just enough to look into, you know, what kind of information an arbitration, an arbitrator should disclose, but then what are we going to do in practice with that information? How are we going to apply it? And it's that application that will decide whether in the future arbitrators will change their conduct. Sorry if it was a bit long. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Now, if we move on to the next topic on disclosure, which is reflected in Article 5, um, Chiara, could you please elaborate on the standard for disclosure of Article 5.1? Um, why was an objective standard for disclosure adopted, and how is Article 5.1 intended to interplay with the non-exhaustive list of circumstances of Article 5.2? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and let me just just start by um, by kind of agreeing with uh, Carol on the sense that uh, the code really provides substantial disclosure, and it is uh, Article Five is one of the key uh, key provision of the code itself, um, because the idea is to really um, request require our adjudicators to disclose as much as possible. So if you look at Article 5.1, for example, which I see now um, is on, the, on, the, um, on display on the video, um, it requires adjudicators to um, disclose um, really a, a, a very comprehensive list to be proactive uh, and, uh, um, and to continue. The adjudicators also have a continuous uh, um, uh, obligations to disclose and really to err in, in, in the sense of disclosing more rather than less, but not disclose what things that are trivial. And the idea of, of Article 5.1 is really to provide a framework uh, for adjudicators uh, to provide, to, to, to be uh, like a chapeau and a framework for adjudicators to, to disclose as much as possible. Um, and the idea of having an objective standard and saying and including as much as possible in terms of make it also adjudicators have to have make a reasonable effort to become aware so there is a kind of a duty of diligence uh, to a certain extent also um, and the idea is to be possible so that parties can decide whether they are satisfied with adjudicators or not and really as as carol was saying um that, that they have a limited amount of time to either um, decide to uh, challenge the arbitrator or not article 51 provides a framework and article 52 really uh, uh, builds on it and provides specific issues that arbitrators have to disclose now article 52 as you will see provides also a lot of bracketed tests text because parties really have to state state delegates and other stakeholders really have to decide what they want to include or not and i would think that when the code will be discussed we're going to have a lot of discussions on the real content of article 52 i also would like to say that article 52 as it stands now 
It really conforms with their disclosure requirements uh, that are found in the ICSID uh, proposed amendment arbitration declarations. And I think that is important because I think we want to try and have um, as much harmony in terms of disclosure as possible. We want to disclose as much as possible in terms of what the parties really want to know so that they want to be that they can be satisfied with with adjudicators uh, themselves um, and as i said there's a lot of bracketed text uh, that i think will be discussed um, in terms of uh, how these will be whether what, what will happen with the challenge afterwards i think we're going to discuss about it later also um, but I, I, just to respond to to what Kari was saying before, I think it's interesting because there is a reference in Article 12 in the commentary just to say that the challenges procedures will continue between every arbitration institutions. But the code comes out with certain constraints also. There are pro challenges procedures that exist and cannot be really changed by the code. There might there might be other processes that. Um, that might be um, they might be required uh, at, at a later stage to change challenges procedures uh, to, to change procedures later. Um, but really, for Article Five now, what we have is provide as much information as possible on a on a, a wide range of things, so that the parties, both parties, are satisfied that the adjudicators is independent and impartial, and that she can provide a satisfactory and, and that they can trust her decisions. Um, when um, when they when she has to make um, substantial decisions on the case. Thank you, Chiara, for that explanation. Uh, Claudia, Article Five One proposes that adjudicators shall make all reasonable efforts to become aware of the interests, relationships, and matters that could reasonably be considered to affect their independence or impartiality. In practice, where do you think the line should be drawn? How far do you think the duty um, to investigate go? Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, well, uh, you know, this uh, when you look at the discussions that the community is having regarding the code of conduct, I will say that uh, the text of Article 5, if one is one of them, you know, that is the most discussed, uh, has caused, uh, you know, some sort of uh, um, uh, revolution talking, you know, uh, out there. And it's precisely because this is related with the conversation that we're having with Carol and, 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 and Chiara in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, where do we want to take all of this? Uh, so I, I do agree with Carol that, um, uh, the, the, you know, when you look at all those statistics, I mean, it is clear that uh, not only the states, but also the investors, they have the same interest. You know, what what do we want here? Well, what we really want is an impartial system, you know, is an impartial independent system that can adjudicate and decide investment disputes. So that's why when Carol was going over all his statistics, uh, which thank you because I haven't done that exercise and is very useful. It really points us to the right direction. That's exactly what uh, you know all the stakeholders they really want. But um, of course, when you come into the particular details, we might find uh, that uh, we might find. I'm sorry that. Uh, uh, the investors, you know, as a stakeholders, they might have a slightly different interest than the states. And to me, Article 5 and later on Article 6, as we will discuss, uh, 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 precisely point to that discussion. Why do I say that? Well, because the investors, of course, uh, probably they will find a little bit overdoing it, this, uh, the, you know, the way that we want to push the system with the disclosures in Article 5 too. You know, if you take the perspective of the state, the state might say, oh, this is great, you know, let's do it. But at the same time, they are not totally happy with uh, the way that Article 5, uh, Article 5 too, looks or maybe do not appreciate that we still have a lot of things in brackets. I think, um, you know, the discussion, as Chiara points out, is going to be precisely what do we want to disclose. I think right now there is no discussion in the system that uh, adjudicators and uh, particular arbitrators, you know, they need to disclose. 
how much is of course the question and, um, and and we really need to find the proper balance but to me you know when i have acted as arbitrator in commercial arbitration disputes i always take the position to apply this subjective test you know because uh, in the eyes of the uh, in the eyes of the parties what do the parties do really want to know uh, you know or, or whether of certain events or acts you know in which i have been involved uh, they can really have an appearance of bias. Uh, so, and that's uh, when you are the adjudicator, I think you really need to take that in a very serious way. Uh, so when I think, you know, I think of a lot of people, they definitely do it because they know that is the only way that we can really have, uh, you know, ultimately an impartial, an impartial system uh, where all the stakeholders, they really trust the system. Uh, so, um, in a way, I really think we need to continue pushing on that uh, subjective test. Uh, although, having said that, to me, what we see in paragraph uh, in paragraph two of Article five is really pointed in the direction of uh, the discussions or the uh, you know the concerns that states have. So I, uh, um, as my friend said, you know, it is important that now everybody, all the stakeholders, in particular the states, you know, they really become very involved in commenting on the, on the code of conduct because, uh, the, you know, to me the examples in Article Five Two, uh, they are a very good, they are a very good start. Honestly, uh, I think the system has matured to the level that. We're there, you know. If we really want to have uh, continue to have uh, third-party funders, you know, in investment arbitration, okay. So let's talk about a proper disclosure also from the part of the arbitrators, uh, you know. So uh, it is a check and balance kind of uh, kind of system. Thank you, Claudia. Now turning to uh, an issue that has drawn a lot of attention um, for Chiara, Article Five Two A Four. Uh, which requires the adjudicator to disclose any significant relationship with any third party funder within the, five, the past five years. What is the intended scope of this provision? Because we understand that uh, on the one hand, the adjudicator may have been hired by a funder. And on the other hand, you could also have the situation of a party who has a funder who may or may have not uh, have a relationship with the adjudicator. So, mm -hmm. how is the provision intended to work in practice? Um, also, the proposed ICSI rules, for example, require the, the parties to disclose the existence of a third party funding when filing the request for arbitration. But what happens, for example, if the applicable rules don't require uh, the disclosure of a third party funder? How does it interplay with Article 5.1 um, that you were explaining earlier and the adjudicator's duty to investigate? Right. Well, th thank you very much. Another uh, very interesting question. Now. Um, the uh, so article um uh, 5 uh, 2 um um a4 and sorry for all these things I, I i hope they can it can also go on, on the screen as you mentioned require certain disclosures and this is a full bracketed test actually and says any third party with a direct or indirect financial interest in the outcome of the proceeding it obviously is directed to third party funding but also to any other so it's not restricted only to third party fundings but funders but others also and i think the idea again is to allow parties to 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 have full knowledge about what is going on and what are the what are the interests are there any interest are there any is there any knowledge uh, what what is the involvement of third party funders uh, we discussed a lot there, there, there have been a lot of discussions about third party funders uh, as claudia also mentioned um, and the idea is disclose as much as possible so that we can have uh, a, a, a a a comprehensive review and discussion and and the different adjudicators. Your second part of the question is, I think, is very interesting also because it talks about the interplay, right? You, you mentioned that the ICSID, um, the new amendment rules, would include a, um, uh, a, a similar rule in the sense of disclosing. Um, and because of Article 5.2, all the parties, even if the arbitration, uh, it's, uh, the, the rules, the applicable rules don't require, because of Article 2, Article 5.2 of the code, all parties will be required to do it. So they will be all in this kind of in the same in, in the same um, in the same field. 
so the article uh, five two will require even uh, uh, um, cases that do not apply ICSI rules to to disclose uh, third party find and, uh, founders also. Thank you very much, Kiara. Uh, Carol, uh, quickly, if you could tell us, in your opinion, whether the code would have the unintended effect uh, to lead to more challenges if more disclosures are made, and if so, how do you suggest preventing such challenges? Well, Anna, yes, I think it's definitely a possibility that um, increased disclosure uh, could lead to an increase uh, of challenges especially in the uh, first couple of months or, or even years uh, when the code of conduct is um, is in force. In particular, uh, I'm concerned and I already raised it uh, about the short period of time that a, a party will have following the disclosure uh, to decide whether or not to bring the challenge. And, and there is a risk because the, the, time, the time frame is so short that uh, parties and their counsel uh, may be tempted to, to file challenges, uh, maybe prematurely, because they are afraid, uh, if they don't raise it, uh, that they will be considered uh, to have waived it uh, later on. So, yes, I think, you know, in, in, in the first couple of years, there, there may be an increase of, of challenges. Now, having said that, I think your, your question on the line there is this idea that we think we should prevent uh, challenges or we should prevent the number of challenges. Um, and I'm not sure I, I agree with that. Um, because after all, I mean, filing a challenge is, is, is a fundamental right of a party. And it's basically the only uh, tool in the box that the party has to ensure that, you know, the people who are going um, to adjudicate uh, these ISDS uh, disputes meet uh, the necessary impartiality and independence test. Uh, it's a fundamental right to bring a challenge uh, that was recently uh, confirmed also, for example, in the in the annulment decision in, in Iser versus Spain. It's a fundamental right. And I think we have to be really careful with uh, limiting uh, fundamental uh, rights. Now, I, I don't necessarily want to be, you know, provocative here, but I wouldn't even mind seeing more challenges. I mean, more successful challenges. Because that, to me, would mean that the rules are becoming stricter and that conduct that was allowed, you know, up, up, up to a few years ago or even up till now, uh, conduct that was acceptable would no longer be um, acceptable. That could increase or restore the trust of the users in ISDS arbitration. And I think that is exactly what this code of conduct is trying to achieve. So um, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a fan and I'm not advocating for more bad or frivolous challenges, but uh, definitely, I mean, I think we got into this situation because the general sense is that um, the rules are not strict enough, or at least the application and enforcement is not strict enough. So um, a stricter code, and, and more successful challenges could, could change that. And I think um, would be a good thing uh, in the long run. May, may I say something just to follow up on this? I think uh, Carol had a, a very good point. I don't think challenges by themselves are, are bad at all. Um, what I think we, the system has shown though, that in the great, great, great majority of cases, the challenges are not sustained, are not upheld. Um, and I think uh, there may be f five cases all, and even uh, uh, you know be behavior that uh, people that that, that several uh, you know that, that, that the stakeholders of of critics critics of um, of the IS, of the ISDS system may find questionable is not judged as uh, something that would be that would sustain a challenge in in the situation in, in most systems that we have now. So I think that code it's and so it seems to me there's a little bit of a discrepancy between 
the ideas that we have and what we would like to have in the rules and maybe how they are applied at the moment by challenges tribunals. And I think the code, one of the, um, uh, the, the, the reasons for the code and the reasons for Article 5 to have so many details in terms of disclosure is also to make the standard clearer and more applicable, more easily applicable by, uh, by the institutions that decide the challenges. Uh, because uh, in the, the, the case also that Carol uh, mentioned, the ISA versus Spain, the, this was an unarmed procedure. This was not a challenge, and the entire um, um, uh, award had to be annulled because of something that happened that could have been resolved possibly in a challenge or anyways, a lack of disclosure. So hopefully the code would avoid this, these situations that would provide more detailed and clearer rules to both adjudicators in terms of disclosures what can be done and also down the line by the institutions that uh, the, the institutions that decide the challenges a clear way to resolve those challenges thank you both very much for, for that um, moving on to our next subject also a very um, interesting one the limit on multiple roles it's reflecting article six um, the code speaks of limit on multiple roles, aiming at regulating the situation that we all know as double heading. We understand that Article 6 of offers various policy options. In particular, it offers a choice of banning double heading entirely or addressing it through disclosure. Here, the code also offers different choices about how to define double heading. Is it when there is a multiplicity of roles involving the same parties or the same treaty, the same facts, etc.? So with that in mind, uh, Maide, what would be um, the, the state's preferred approach? Do you think a prohibition is warranted or is the issue best addressed through disclosure? Thank you, Anna, for that uh, question. Um, I feel somewhat of a, of a big burden to represent the state's voice uh, in this conversation, specifically on a, on a topic like this one. Um, so I'll do my best, but I, I think it, it is fair to say that a simple disclosure of information without limiting in some way, shape, or form uh, the possibility for adjudicators to, to wear multiple hats is not going to be favored by the majority of, of states. Uh, what is going to be more complicated to decide is, is uh, what would be the scope of this potential prohibition. Um, and again, I, on, on that particular question, I think that perhaps if we just uh, limit um, the, the prohibition to cases where, where, where there's the same parties and the same facts, this is only going, this, this is going to prove insufficient because it's only going to prevent very obvious conflicts of interest. There are other questions that I think are more are, are less straightforward. For example, what are the roles that, that will be included? Is it only counsel and arbitrator? Or should we also include experts and um, an agent, for example, which is a term that is used currently on the draft that perhaps needs to be further further clarified. Another big topic is, is um, whether it should just cover the same treaty or all international investment uh, investment agreements. And perhaps the most difficult one is, is the temporal question. Um, and by this, I mean whether the limitation should apply to wearing two or more hats uh, for cases running simultaneously, or if it should also apply to cases that they take place um, before or after that individual has uh, concluded its role as, as adjudicator. So I think hopefully on all this, we will have a better sense of where we are when in, in October, once we get um, the comments, the comments have been sent to the to the secretaries. Um, but, I, but I do think it's worth realizing that for, for some states, uh, banning double heading might not be a, a huge new step uh, as it's a policy decision that, that they've already made. Thank you. Thank you, Mayra. Um, now, diving into double heading and diversity, uh, Claudia, let's start with you. The arbitrator pool is slowly uh, being renewed by council working at firms. Firms have made uh, we can say modest progress in terms of gender equality and regional representation. For example, the recent ICA report on gender diversity brought to light data published by the American Bar Association in 2019, showing that while nearly half of the associates and law firms were women, less than a third are partners and fewer than 20% are equity partners. 
Um, so if there was a ban on double heading, defining double heading as the multiple roles of counsel and arbitrator, what would be the impact on diversity in your opinion, if any? And do you think there would be a limit on the pool of arbitrators or would it have a positive effect on diversity? And do you have any views on whether this would also impact diversity in terms of expertise, for example? Well, this is uh, one of the most difficult questions, I think, uh, you know, that the court is, uh, the court is bringing us, you know, and, uh, uh, and it doesn't have an easy answer, you know, uh, because on the one hand, as Maire is saying, I mean, if we don't really attack double hatting in um, in a serious and consistent way um personally this is my view uh we uh i mean we're damaging the system you know so we are um that we are at the point that there are criticisms of uh, feeling that the system is not uh, uh independent you know that there is lack of legitimacy because uh, you know you have people acting both ways arbitrators and then also counsel and benefiting from the decisions that they render as arbitrators you know to use in the cases where they are acting and defending cases as counsel so it is a very sensitive uh, subject for the community and i'm glad to see that the code is actually taking taking it you know for discussion with the stakeholders so um hopefully at the end uh, you know the whole community will find a good way to address this uh, um this issue uh, you know, but ultimately, uh, you know, the other aspect of the discussion is exactly what you are bringing to the table. I mean, uh, how can we guarantee that we're getting ready to prepare the next generation of arbitrators? You know, how can we uh, the, get, uh, the, you know, guarantee that we're also uh, you know, uh, the, given the opportunity to uh, more women to act as arbitrators, you know, to younger generations to act as arbitrators. Uh, ultimately, we all know that this is a circle, you know, I mean, uh, arbitrators, they do not necessarily get appointed when do not have a lot of experience, uh, you know, so and then but how do you get the experience if you're not getting any appointments? So uh, I don't know that I have the answer, Anna, and I am really sorry to disappoint everybody here, but um, I have been thinking a lot about this question, uh, not only in the context of the code of conduct, but really on the context of the broader scope. I mean, what is really double hiding issue uh, that, you know, uh, bringing or affecting the system? And then this ultimate question of how do we open the panel, you know, to everybody else? Um, so um, I don't have the solution, but what I can tell you is that, uh, uh, you know, states, they feel very concerned about this issue. And, uh, and I can understand why, you know, I can understand why definitely. Uh, probably um, um, a middle ground uh, with some teeth on it will do. You know, I know that in the proposal there are brackets to suggest that, uh, you know, we can do it with certain uh, limitations, like during a period of time, you know, to give opportunity to others to come and start acting as arbitrators. Um, but at the same time, maybe we need to be more creative. Maybe we need to think about ways where, the, you know, those new generations of arbitrators or to act uh, or to have more women in the, uh, uh, you know, to be appointed as arbitrators in investment arbitration, they can get that experience by doing uh, other type of work, as secretaries of tribunals, for example, uh, you know, to really get into the discussions uh, uh, at issue in investment arbitration. I mean, it's only an idea that I'm having, you know, when you really assist a tribunal, of course, you get exposed to and, uh, you know, the substantive discussions in these cases, and that ultimately brings you uh, some experience, you know, for the, uh, for the subject matter. Um, but, uh, but I have to, I have to confess that uh, uh, so far, uh, I do, I do feel that uh, this is something that is, uh, is, is really, the, the, I wouldn't say damaging the system, but risking, risking the legitimacy of the system from the perspective, especially of the states. Like I said, I mean, I, I think um, I don't have an answer, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, I know that some of the discussions have been, well, you know, let's just uh, 
erase it all, you know, let's just really have only uh, people who are going to really act as adjudicators, and then that's it. If we really want to go that way, which I think that's the position of the states, well, as a community, we have to face that that's the situation. That's, we're going to be acting that way for a few years. Maybe some people would like it, maybe other people will not like it. But ultimately, if that is a benefit uh, for the system, then, uh, you know, uh, probably we have to move in that direction. But I'm very curious about what my other panelists, you know, they uh, they think about the subject. And also, I mean, the new generation, you know, I know that uh, we have a lot of uh, young uh, uh, practitioners that they have joined us for today's discussion. So this is, to me, this is the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, Chiara or Maire, do you want to add anything? May I say something very briefly? I, I agree with Claudia and Marie. This is really a, a very, very important topic. But I, I, on one side, I think when the train has left the station, we really have to do something about it. There are a lot of, require, of requests that uh, we, we, we tackle this issue and has been uh, highlighted as an important uh, as an important issue. It, um, my remark is just on a very specific things and about the pipeline of new adjudicators. And I think what we are looking at now is the, the fear that the pipeline might dry if we go, if we if we um, ban double hatting. I think we can be more creative. I think, as, as Claudia also suggested, there are different pools of possible candidates. I think we want to look at. Uh, you know, people that have served in institutions at, at ICSA, at PCA, or that have served at, in, in, in states delegation. We want to look at academics. I don't think the pipeline has to come only from, from council or from people that have served as council. I think there are many different groups, and I think we can look at, um, at all these different pools of, uh, of people that would be very good, uh, very good adjudicators in ISDS system, and uh, we provide new pipeline. Thank you, Kiara. or Carol, anything on the topic? I have a, a very uh, quick um, comment, and I'm sorry there's part of the conversation that I might have lost because I uh, got dropped off. Um, but it's just the, um, your question, Anna, actually uh, made me uh, think further about, about this, this issue. And um, I think. The, the report, the ICA report, actually shows us that the lack of, of diversity in arbitration uh, is a problem that exists with or without double heading. It's not limited to double heading, and it's going to be there uh, because it's an issue that, as a community, we've been unable or at least unwilling. To, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, unwilling or at least unable to to tackle because uh, it requires a lot of of persistent of persistent effort. So. Um, I think that uh, putting those two things as uh, if you ban double heading, then you are against diversity. To me, it's not it's not the, the the right approach. And in a way, it's as if we're saying, okay, we have two problems. Then instead of trying to resolve one, which is double heading, then let's just leave both as they are. Because honestly, I don't think uh, if we just uh, if, if we don't ban double hiding, I'm not sure that's going to resolve our diversity problem. And I dare to say, even it's not even going to assist in a material way to to resolve it because we are where we are and we don't have a ban on double hiding. So um, I, I believe we need to fix the problem that can be fixed right now. Um, and that and the, the perception of, of illegitimacy like uh, like. Claudia was already mentioning that the practice of double heading has, has brought to, to the system has had very important effects. Uh, there's a lack of credibility of decisions. There's a lack of acceptance of, of, this, of outcomes by disputing parties. And so I do think we have to think very clearly if this is not a sufficient reason to, to properly regulate the, the practice there and, and ban it. Thank you so much. Um, we now can move on to the issue of enforcement. I know we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, Carol, would you mind sharing with us how do you envision the enforcement process of the draft code of, to develop? And we're skipping to enforcement because it's a question that's been asked a lot by the audience as well. And we think it's important to cover it. Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. Well, it, it, it was already mentioned uh, 
briefly by Chiara at the very beginning. The, um, the code now provides that um, the, co the, the, um, the code would be enforced basically through the existing applicable rules. Uh, that's, I think, in, in, yeah, we have it there on the screen, 12.2. Um, um, now, now, to me, that that is a problem. Um, why is it a problem? It, there, there are two elements. First of all, um, the code is trying to create a, a uniform platform, correct? So the idea is that um, basically this code should apply across the board to all ESDS matters, is it irrespective of what rules apply. Now, the problem with that is that the rules are not the same. So to give you the example, I think is the most important one. If, if you look at the exit rules and the UNCTRAL rules, under the exit rules, in order to disqualify um, an arbitrator, you need to establish you need to establish that there is a manifest lack of you know the impartiality or independence. So it's 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 a high threshold, whereas under the UNCTRAL rules, it's more akin to a reasonable doubts test. So that that is a difference between those two rules. Now you may have the same in principle, same conduct that applies, but if it is applied in a different manner, then obviously you don't, you're not going to create this uniform framework. So I think one of the things, and, and, and I acknowledge, uh, Chiara, uh, you've mentioned it before, there's obviously limits to what this conduct can do. Um, so not, not, not every solution will necessarily be found within the, con the code of conduct itself, but definitely in terms of the enforcement, if we want a uniform system, you also have to apply the code uh, in a uniform uh, manner. That's not the case today. Uh, for example, again, you know, and, and because often people say with statistics, you can prove anything, but sometimes statistics are useful to prove a point. Uh, on, under the exit challenges, uh, so 44 challenges, so I'm not just looking at the last five years, but all of the challenges that have been filed so far, uh, there have been 144 um, challenges that were decided. Only five have been upheld out of 144. So that, that's less than 5%. A UTSI 12. And you know, again, I can explain you how the grounds for challenge, basically the grounds for challenge, the issues, you know, the, the issue of conflict, the repeat appointments, the relationships and whatever, those are the same concerns under UNCITRO as under EXIT. So that's not the reason for, for the difference between the two. But the outcome of the UNCITRO, because you have a different standard, in the last 10 years, uh, there were 30 challenges and there, six of them were upheld, so that's 20%. So there's a real difference between the standard applied under exit and the standard that is applied at UCTRA. So when it comes to enforcing the code, I think we will need to find a way of trying to bring the standards uh, more uh, closely together. And I think what is needed is more guidance, more guidance on, 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 you know, and it may come in, in the form of maybe, you know, the explanations to the different articles. I think they can be more, they should be even more detailed. So uh, I think more can be done on guidance to be given to um, parties when they appoint arbitrators, uh, because sometimes I think you can already see it written in the stars that a challenge may be coming. So I think appointing parties may be more careful Arbitrators uh, may be more careful in uh, accepting um, uh, appointments. And then obviously, you know, guidance for counsel who is considering bringing a challenge and the adjudicators, now, that, 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 that's one thing. The other thing uh, I think is that it would be good in terms of the enforcement that uh, probably the reasoning of the challenge decisions um, could be more detailed, 
uh, because it's in the reasoning, in the explanations, and I'm thinking in particular about, uh, for example, the ICSID chairman, you know, who under the ICSID rules, um, in, in, in a number of occasions, it's, it's for the chairman of ICSID to decide these challenges. Now, that is, I mean, although it's not binding, of course, but it creates some sort of, you know, precedent for future challenges. Uh, I think uh, the, over the last couple of years, the reasoning have been has been shortened. So I think um, if you have detailed reasoning, parties will uh, understand much better the, the, the contours of what is acceptable uh, and not acceptable. But then the last thing I want to say is on in uh, on enforcement is that obviously you know the the the, the main remedy um, is is disqualification. But obviously, that's 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 a harsh sanction. I think um, it wouldn't be bad if the range of sanctions is broadened, and that, for example, it's not necessarily or only a disqualification because you know, we know that that threshold is very high. But for example, softer sanctions, um, such as you know reducing uh, the fees of an arbitrator. Um, maybe imposing a temporary ban on on accepting new appointments if you misbehaved uh, in a certain manner. Um, so I think we need to think uh, and be more creative about sanctions as well. F to give you one example, uh, we discussed uh, 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 about disclosure. Now, case law today says that failing to disclose in and of itself is not a reason to disqualify someone. Now, how are we going to enforce just the disclosure? Even if we try, even if, it, if, it, if an authority decides that you should have disclosed something, but you didn't, or you didn't investigate a certain conflict, but it, it doesn't warrant, you know, a disqualification as such. I think we need a, a broader range of sanctions to also, you know, be able to to give these provisions uh, teeth and and to be stricter on a number of issues. Thank you very much, okay. Carol. Uh, we're running out of time. I don't know if Kara, you want to say something very quickly on this topic. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to very quickly. Um, so I'm in agreement with Carol that we have to have to find some other ways in which the, the enforcement might have more teeth. Uh, Article 12 now says that it's really on the arbitrator, on the adjudicator, um, him or herself, and then the challenges, it would be good to find a medium like other ways. I think it's at uh, the system exists at the moment, it would be really hard. I don't know what arbitral institutions can really do. Um, but I think there are possible ways, depending on how the code itself is, is enforced. If we have a treaty, for example, if you have a, a multilateral convention, or whether it's going to be each, each arbitration, arbitral institutions. And I think there are a lot of discussions about that. I think it would be very important for um, stakeholders and state representatives to really discuss what options exist. And I think that would be important also to signal uh, how how important they find the code to be. One possibility is to possibly create like a common, uh, um, um, a, like a, a, an organization, a committee that may look, uh, they collect data and, and, publish, and, and publish the data. So I think you're right, we, we need to be a little creative. I think there are constraints in arbitral institutions now, but there are possibilities to do uh, maybe something, uh, something different uh, that would allow um, other sorts of uh, um, of uh, sanctions to be implemented, and I would think that possibly maybe a committee might might be a uh, like a, a common organization might be uh, might be um, uh, helpful. Thank you, um, Claudia or Maire, Do you want to add anything on this issue? Um, now, maybe just to close, Maire, could you? Ideally, how do you think challenges should be decided? Do you think they should be decided by an ethics committee, for example? Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, originally, I, I thought that perhaps um, arbitral institutions, since they are uh, generally when acting as, as a pointing authority, um, 
thinking uh, as to what could give rise to potential conflict and they already have the installed capacity and knowledge to make this kind of determination perhaps that could be a good a good way forward but i do realize as, as i think both uh, carol and kara had mentioned that that if different institutions are in charge then that means we, we're not going to move uh towards a uniform application of, of, of rules. And, and, and that's where the idea of an ethics committee become um, more attractive. Now, um, the, I, I still see difficulties with an ethics uh, committee because um, how are you gonna appoint the members? Uh, where are they gonna come from? Um, especially in a multicultural setting, a lot of time ethical issues are related to, to questions of, of, of public policy, of what's moral, what's proper, what's ethical um, in a particular place, setting the culture. And so it, it might be um, more difficult to, to implement it than what we think. But but in this question of enforcement, I think apart from, from finding ways of, of uh, or at least uh, determining what to do when um, the ethical rules are not respected, perhaps uh, my call would be to, to think of ways of, of incentivizing um, our adjudicators to comply with the rules because at the end of the day, as Claudia mentioned before, what we're all looking for is just a system that that works and that um, that is that has adjudicators uh, deciding disputes um, in an impartial and, and independent manner. So, so perhaps that's uh, that would be my my um, ideal. And 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 to finish, um, I do think that the, the possibility of incorporating the code and, and even perhaps a common standard uh, for challenges in a motel investment reform agreement. Um, a general code as the one that we've been discussing at, at Incitral is, would be a, a good implementation option. Thank you very much. Does anyone have anything to add? Well, Go. just, uh, you know, just to follow on this topic, I think um, um, Ultimately, what we need to think, in my opinion, is that what we are looking and discussing right now here uh, is uh, there are really issues that uh, we knew, you know, that at some point we needed to face uh, and address. And I'm very happy to see uh, that uh, ICSID has been the, taking that challenge, you know, together with UNCITRAL. Uh, so, and I, I'm happy to see that. Uh, hopefully, you know, the discussions ultimately are going to be substantive and ultimately there will be some decisions made uh, because uh, to me, uh, you know, the system is at that point that we need to address issues like the code of conduct, you know, that we're discussing here today in a very serious way and um, and I just want to welcome you know and thank the opportunity you know to discuss that topic because um, um, uh, I think it's um, it's the right is the right direction you know but uh, but hopefully the discussions you know will ultimately materialize in something that is more concrete because when um, if we can make it happen you know it's going to happen in a way that we are addressing you know, the reform of the whole system. And the reform of the whole system couldn't really be done, you know, without this particular topic. So in a way, you know, it's part of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think uh, this is a good place to end uh, today's webinar. Um, before we do so, um, I just want to note that ICSID welcomed public comments on the draft code of conduct until October 15 of this year. Comments from states, international organizations, and other interested stakeholders will be compiled and published jointly by UNCITRAL and ICSID as well in the form and language in which they're received. Um, it's very important for both organizations to have a balanced discussion as we've discussed today and with the four welcome comments from all involved in investor state dispute settlement. And with that, uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, and I wish to thank uh, our panelists, thank you very much for today's discussion. Uh, you brought some really interesting thoughts to the table. Um, also, thank you to all participants who joined us today. We very much appreciate your, your participation, and we hope to see you in the next Young Exit event, uh, hopefully this fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.